So I thought we would just do kind of a soft opening this morning, and again, with a topic that's, I think, pretty important and, again, exciting for me to, to share with you. You guys all know about the Autoimmune Hepatitis Association. You've come here, you've come to the conference, but I want to tell you a little bit more. I like to do this every year and just to brag a little bit about what we've done, and I truly mean we. Uh, this isn't Aaron Anderson and Craig Lambert. This is the patient community, and again, in partnership. And I'm really proud of a lot of the things that we've done, and, and hopefully this generates some excitement with you as well. I just want to share some of the structure and architecture. Uh, unfortunately, a number of the AIH board directors could not come this weekend, uh, but Andrew I, Veronica Williams, Luke Britt, and then myself sit on this. This has changed over the years, but, but again, these uh, have been tremendous leaders and contributing to our direction. They all have some tie or personal story to this disease. Um, and actually care about the patients and the, the movement of patients tremendously. Uh, everyone knows Erin An uh, Anderson. I introduced her yesterday. Um, again, this conference would not happen without Erin, and Erin has been a tremendous <laughs> asset to AIHA. Uh, yeah, I think it, probably a round of applause. Uh. Beyond what she does for, for the patient community, she puts up with me. Um, my phone calls, driving home from work at 6 o'clock at night, my texts at 11. Um, so Aaron, thank you for all you do for this organization. We really couldn't do it without you. So the next piece of news that I think is really exciting, and I also hate that she's not here, but Megan Apolzen smith is going to be our next employee. This makes two for us. Uh, she's going to be the coordinator of pediatric programs and special programs for the AIHA. And one thing that I've seen as a vision for us is that the pediatric impact is falling short of what we do for adult patients. And again, you may have seen that. We've, we've invited the pediatric hepatology program at IU to work here with us this weekend. We didn't have much pediatric involvement in this conference, although we wanted a lot. Um, I think there's many children, many families that are affected by this disease and struggle with some of the major things that adults struggle with. And I think we need to focus on education in the future and how do we move the disease forward for kids and families that are touched by this disease as well. And I really think Megan, is going to be the centerpiece of that for the AIHA, so I'm very excited for that as well. We have a very extensive medical board, and again, you've met some of these uh, providers and players throughout the course of yesterday. A lot of faces, these are at multiple institutions across the country, all with distinct interests and expertise, ranging from pulmonology to pediatric hepatology to gastroenterology. Um, we have mental health. Uh, we have uh, people from Yale. We have people from UCSF. Again, these are the leaders for this disease on the clinician and research side. Again, they're also very much in, in aware of the need for patient involvement, connection, and moving the disease forward as well. I didn't get to thank our volunteers from the IU Hepatology Division yesterday, but again, this conference couldn't happen without them, and there's so much that goes on behind the scenes that you may not know. Uh, a number of these, uh, these players in my team come because they love this conference and they love you. Um, they love what we do and what we've started here at IU, and they want to be a part of it. And in fact, we almost never have to ask or beg for people to come. They want to show up. They want to participate, and they want to hear from you. So one person, which I don't know if she's in the room, is Kelsey here at all? Kelsey Green is the coordinator for the GRACE study. She works with me closely. We have a very brother-sister relationship. I've known Kelsey for about five years. She's the only person that works with me that doesn't leave me. Um, but Kelsey has put up with a lot from me, and she also stays because of you. Uh, she loves the autoimmune liver disease world. She loves the AIH patients. She finds them challenging, and she finds real meaning in her life to work in the clinic, but also on the nonprofit angle, too. So if you see Kelsey today, she'll be running around. Um, tell her thank you. Our membership pool is growing, and again, when we started with our very first conference, gosh, 2014, we had 130 people show up, sight unseen, nobody knew us. It started with me just talking to patients on Facebook communities and giving information from the research articles that I read. We now have over 4,000 registered members, and I, I will also ask if you are not registered, please go on our website and sign up, and all that means is you get a monthly email from us. That's some interesting uh, lead-in that usually Aaron writes for me, and then some of our programming and information and things that are going on. 
Um, outside of that, we think points of contact are really important. Again, we would never contact you or sell you anything. The, the most important part is it building this community to make sure that you're engaged in what we're doing from the patient perspective, but also the research side as well. I really think patients, the closer you are to the organization, the researchers, the better we will all be. We have over 6,000 members that follow us on Facebook. Uh, of these patients, again, it's a kind of demographic breakdown. Again, this is a woman-specific disease, so we have about 88% of our patients and members are female. But we have a pretty significant male contingent as well. And ultimately, as you probably hear many times, our aim is to really provide support and hope to you, but, but really by focusing on education. But we want you involved in research, and you're gonna hear this theme throughout the day today. One thing that we did this past year uh, with a small grant was we developed a new patient toolkit. One of the things that I always hated and when I was finding when I was doing the Zoom calls for the new patient orientation or new patient support groups, the information is scattered. And I want you to kind of think back to when you were diagnosed. Where did you find your information? Where did you go? Google? Here? So you found us, that, and that's what we wanted to be. Um, but even on our site, Information is kind of spread out. So we said, why don't we put everything together in one kind of packet? You could just kind of do a, a little mini course and you could kind of get up and running with this disease and at least know how this disease works, know about the resources. How do you find a doctor that even knows anything about this disease? How do you optimize those visits with those doctors, which I'll talk about later as well? And then what are the questions you should be asking? These are the things that we are hearing time and time again. So it's all in one place. And if you haven't checked it out, I think it's still worthwhile. Even if you've had this disease for a few years, you may find some information there. Our online resources, the other exciting thing uh, in our attempt to reach uh, more diverse populations, we had a number of our pages translated to Spanish. This may not seem like a big deal, but it was a huge deal. And in fact, one of the reasons we had some of our colleagues from Mexico come, because I think there's a real need in the Latinx community for this disease. Now this message may have been lost on some of you, but black patients and Latinx patients have some of the worst disease with AIH. Not to compare to Caucasians, but ultimately they are harder to control, they have more cirrhosis at diagnosis, the more prednisone dependency and more comorbid, uh, more comorbid uh, diseases. So we need to make sure we are catering to them. And also in light of social economic status, and again, seeing that a little bit more in those communities, we need to make sure we're making every effort to meet them where they are as a patient community. Some local resources that we've been doing too, in your packets, uh, you were given a, a book of trifolds. Um, I'm still surprised how many patients ask for a trifold. Are trifolds useful? Can I just ask? So, the patient that comes in, I diagnosed with autoimmune hepatitis, they asked for the information. I said, well, actually, I run a nonprofit. You can actually go on the website. They're like, what about a, what about a trifold? And I'm like, okay, it's 2023, but this is important. And again, it's on the wall in my office. We would love if you would take those back to your doctors, kind of a word of mouth advertising. If you haven't talked to your doctor that you've attended an AIH nonprofit meeting, put them on their toes. Um, you may actually get better performance from them when they, they know that you know what you're talking about. So again, if you ever need more packets or you want to disperse them wider, we are happy to send those to you. Um, and again, this is part of that grassroots community involvement to get other centers more involved in this disease. We've made a major push with health equity. I talked to you a little bit about black uh, and Latinx patients. We have a uh, diversity committee and one of the projects that we're really excited about, Lauren Nephew presented yesterday. We're gonna present this at the liver meeting in about four weeks. Um, but we found, and this is not surprising, but a high burden of unmet needs in patients with AIH that gets worse the lower socioeconomic status they have. Um, and this is a perfect example of where a nonprofit can come in and maybe fix some of those gaps. So we're very, very excited to move in that direction. And again, we'll hopefully we'll have more as Michelle Tana spoke yesterday. There are other opportunities for research to better understand. And this, this research, which will be published, is coming from you. This is meeting you in your living room, in your car, on your phone. So again, talking about the research theme, there's no reason not to be involved in research. Our support groups are going very strong. Gosh, we have now eight or nine Aaron support groups. Uh, we've used these support groups in a lot of different ways. Research studies have been one of them, but ultimately what they were designed to do, support. I'm, I'm always amazed, and I tell everyone, I get on the new patient support group, and I think we do that every quarter. Um, the stories I hear about the experiences around diagnosis, 
what doctors and allied staff are doing for patients and how nutty sometimes it is, but also sometimes how good it is. And just the excitement for people to come into a space, whether it's Zoom or in this room, and see a patient that has maybe had a taste of what you've experienced for some reason is so magical. So this past year, we also did a patient-led focused drug development meeting. This was paired with the FDA. So this is exciting. We're on the FDA's radar. They know our patients are organized and they demand more. What we kind of found with this meeting, and again, thank you for all those that participated, but we went to that meeting thinking that we need a model or approach that considers how heterogeneous you all are, but ultimately results in some kind of individualized care plan. As of now, maybe azathioprine for you, Celsep for you, or here's some more prednisone. Is there a way that we can optimize this and strategize? Are there predictors of disease? We need to better understand this. At the end of this meeting, there are really three themes. We want treatments to be a whole heck of a lot better with tremendous reduction in corticosteroids. We want quality of life to be dramatically improved, and we really want to see more movement in research in diverse populations. And at the end of the day, the ideal therapy for all those pieces would be easy to tolerate. Now think about your current regimen. Easy to tolerate. It controls your inflammation very well. It actually prevents or regresses liver fibrosis. It makes you feel good. Your symptoms melt away, and it works in every single diverse population, black, Latinx, white people, and others. I should say, you know, azathioprine and CELSEP data has most historically been studied in white people, yet we apply that information to all demographics. The patient registry is also going strong as well. We're over 160 patients that have been enrolled. Um, this registry is something that you can do also from the comfort of your couch at home. And Kelsey Green, who also works as my coordinator for the Gray Study IDU, is the study coordinator for the AIHA's AIH Connect. Um, she connects with you via email. You fill out a number of questionnaires. Uh, we actually are discussing and evolving a place where we actually can develop and collect biospecimens. And you say, well, what is that good for? Ultimately, the reason we want to do this is we think by knowing where patients are, what their needs are, what their disease phenotype is, we can actually help direct future studies for this disease as well. Again, when Kazar comes to us and says, where are your patients with the biggest need? Well, I can tell you there's a cluster of patients in the Northeast around Mass, uh, Mass General that really need better care. So if there's five patients there, suddenly we can target Mass General as a place for a clinical trial or study if drug companies are looking. This is the idea, and again, if we can have better resolution, we can steer those clinical trials and maybe ultimately get these trials enrolled faster and learn more about the disease sooner. The AIHA is also really making its mark on research and treatment as well. So we know this, this disease is related to immune-regulated attack. You have inflammatory cells that infiltrate the liver, causes inflammation and fibrosis, and then you get a bunch of symptoms. That's this disease in a nutshell. Well, there's two places the AIHA has actually worked to develop research studies and specifically treatment studies to optimize a few of these pieces. So one of the most exciting things that we are just not yet ready, and as Dr. Weinberg said yesterday, this is not prime time. Uh, we've been working with the FDA to try to get what's called an investigational new drug application approved to give mesenchymal stem cells to patients with autoimmune hepatitis. Now stem cells is a little bit of a hot topic. Uh, it can also be a buzzword or even a hot button word as well, but these are stem cells that are collected from umbilical cords, so medical waste. Stem cells have this unique ability to qualm, squash, all kinds of inflammation, and they actually secrete different anti-inflammatory pieces as well. We've been using stem cells in other diseases, which is kind of surprising. You may not necessarily know that, but lupus nephritis, so a kidney condition related to lupus, which can actually be quite terrible for patients, has been one strategy, particularly our collaborators at MUSC, has used a mesenchymal stem cells for. So we're hopeful to get this up and running in the next couple months. This has been held up by the FDA, but ultimately I think we have seen progress and this is a project that we're funding through the AIHA as well and that will be conducted here at Indiana University. The next piece that is really exciting because I've been talking about this for years is the role of diet on this disease and not only just how it controls symptoms, inflammations, overall quality of life, there's a number of questions that are just unanswered. Now diet studies are ubiquitous. 
In all diseases, they've been done. They're hard to do. They're usually small. The effects are sometimes good, sometimes no change. We've worked uh, with collaborators at IU Bloomington as well as Purdue University to design the best diet study that we can do for autoimmune hepatitis patients. There's been a lot of thought and consideration of this, a lot of back and forth and a lot of questions of what is the right diet to see will work. And really this stemmed from me always complaining as I'm leaving the office, I do a patient visit, I'm getting ready to leave the door, I put my hand on the door handle and the patient always will say, well, hey, Lambert, what, what do I need to eat? I'm like, I don't know. So my, my, usual, my usual response is, again, just inadequate. Ultimately, I would always ask people to eat for other organs, you know, specifically cardiovascular health and such as well. But the data in the past three to five years really evolved. And what we've seen is Mediterranean diet is kind of a habitual diet that incorporates a lot of different things that have some good data as an anti-inflammatory model. Now, again, this study, there's never been a diet study in AIH. There's actually only been one other diet study in another autoimmune liver disease. So this is incredibly exciting. We've enrolled two patients, and this is out of Indiana University. And just to kind of show you the study design, I'll show it to you later. Ultimately, we'll have patients where they get eight weeks of either Mediterranean diet or Western diet. They'll be looked at before and after that eight weeks. They will then take a break. Then they will move to the other diet. This food is all provided to patients. It's delivered right to their door. And again, this is the best diet study that we could afford. And again, this is all possible from donors associated with this organization. This is an incredibly expensive study, but I think the findings that we'll get from this will maybe change the face of what we think about diet and its involvement in this disease in the future. So here's my call to action before I hand it over to Aaron Anderson for the very last part of this. I really encourage you to join online, you're already here, you're participating, so thank you. But get your other partners and friends online too to consider these things as well. Ask your doctor to be involved. Ask them if they've heard of us. Do they use our resources? The more doctors that know about it and their patients may also utilize the AIHA for education, I think will change the face of this disease going forward. And then also consider participation in our registry. Leadership wise, I would love for you all to be leaders in your own right, and I'll talk a little bit later about the role of the professional or expert patient. Um, participate in your local support groups. There's nine of them. There's a place for everyone. And again, the people you've met this weekend, hopefully these relationships continue forward. And again, I think that peer support is an incredible important model for chronic disease. And then volunteerism, connecting with Aaron or myself in ways that you can be involved in this community, whether it's leading support groups or working with a registry or doing other things uh, behind the seats, we always need more hands. Then finally, financially, and uh, the giving aspect, we run this organization from the, the donors that we have. Um, ultimately, you know, we are small. We have two employees now. But again, growth is always on the mind because if we're going to make a true impact, I think we have to grow. But we're already doing things that are making a measurable difference in this disease. Think about year-end fundraising this year. So here we are in October. Um, we'll have a big campaign, I suspect, over the course of the next month or two. Um, you can give individual gifts. You can do birthday uh, things. These are all these small gifts definitely add up. Amazon Prime and Smile. I think Smile got done with, but company matches. And then think about your true skills and talents. Is there anything that you do? And I've heard a lot of interesting things about you this weekend. We have a highly skilled group of patients with a lot of skill sets. So if there's an aspect that you think could benefit us, please talk to us about it. So just in conclusion, I want you to know the AIHA is proactively working to really improve our educational profile, research opportunities to make sure patients are involved, but also taking a stand when therapies count. And again, our key focus for the next year or two is really to seek uh, serving underserved populations, but also search for those patients that are the biggest gaps, those hard to control patients, patients that are still on steroids, patients that have terrible quality of life. AIH Connect, if you haven't thought about it, the research registry for the AIH, uh, you can sign up here today. It would be really easy, effective. You can do it when you go home, too. But at the end of the day, just know that we are working on your behalf as well as with you to get you more meaningful research projects underway. So thank you all for being here. Um, this is an exciting time for us. I, I can't tell you more. And again, every time we have this conference, it's just amazing that we have people from Alaska, from LA, from the Southeast. Um, this community is strong. And again, I applaud you all for coming and, and doing a full day yesterday as well and being here at 7.30 this morning. So thank you so much.
The AIHA is really only able to do the work that we do thanks to the incredible volunteers who play a truly absolutely essential role um, in our organization. So we have a number of volunteers who are in attendance at the conference, so I wanted to take the opportunity to recognize them publicly and say thank you. So as I recognize each of our volunteers, if you wouldn't mind coming up on stage, um, we'd love to take a group photo after. So just stay on stage until the very end. I'd first like to recognize Janet Blyden, who is our Southeast support group leader. And she also serves on our fundraising committee and also on our conference planning com committee. Um, basically, anytime I ask for a volunteer, she raises her hand, and it's greatly appreciated. Um, she's just always ready to jump in and help. So thank you, Janet. I'd also like to recognize Carrie Dodd, who serves on our fundraising committee and leads our newly created support group for men. He does an incredible job of connecting with other patients. If you are a male patient at this conference with this disease and you haven't connected with him yet, I'd highly encourage you to. Thank you, Carrie. Rachel Schmidt, um, I know she's at the conference. I'm not quite sure if she's here yet this morning, but did want to, she is? Where are you? Oh, oh, she's coming in. Great. Rachel, I was just about to recognize you. We're doing some volunteer recognition. Um, Rachel serves on our fundraising committee and has been an essential part of helping to raise funds for this organization. As a professional fundraiser, she brings a lot of expertise to the organization and is always willing to help. So thank you, Rachel. Christy Feeney leads our Midwest support group. She does an amazing job of bringing together patients in the Midwest for conversation, and she's always willing to listen. So Christy, thank you. I think Sammy had to leave early, um, but I did want to recognize her because she was here at the conference as well. She's one of our newer volunteers. She's a co-leader of our support group for young adults, and I've just been so impressed by the way she leads the group and makes everyone feel welcome and heard. So we'll pass on her gift to her. We'll mail it to her. I'd also like to recognize Caitlin Perkosha. I don't think she's here yet this morning, but we'll hear from her later today. She serves on our conference planning committee and she helped us brainstorm ideas for sessions to include in this year's conference. Um, and she's responsible for many of the sessions that you see on the agenda. Um, so just wanted to publicly thank her. Um, I'd also like to recognize Susan Smith. Um, she deserves an extra special thank you. She's been integral to helping us recruit patients to join our patient registry to advance research for this rare disease. She's extremely passionate about helping other patients and she and her family have been incredible supporters of this organization. So quick plug for the registry. She wouldn't want me to forget to do this. Um, if you haven't joined, please be sure to do so. You can join today in the research room. So thank you again, Susan. We're gonna do a picture in just a moment. And last but not least, I'd like to give an extra special thank you to Kelsey Green and Regina Weber. Kelsey is way at the back. Um, we'll have a gift to give you after, Kelsey. Um, Regina administered the fiber scans that many of you um, had the opportunity to get while you were here. And Kelsey has just helped in so many ways. Um, she's been helping with research um, today. She's just been helping with conference planning and organizing. Um, just any, anything we need, she helps with. Thank you, Kelsey. And I know if you'd all like to stand up, um, I want to see where our photographer, oh, perfect.
Yeah, we'd like to, we do this every conference. We'd like to invite everyone to come up. We'd like to try to do a group photo. So we might not be able to get everyone on the stage, but if everyone in attendance would come forward, we're gonna try to do a group, group photo. Thank you all. All right. Everybody's looking right up here. Everybody smiling and happy. Big fake laugh on three, one, two, three, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Thank you very much.